In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> For quite a few years now, um, with a bit of tongue-in-cheek, I've been say enjoying saying things like, back in my day, and when I was a lad, uh, even though I have only had one more birthday than Jesus ever did when he walked the earth. But things have changed a lot since last millennium, to state the blindingly obvious. And I delight in hearing from others about how things have changed since they were younger. Stories of horses and carts in Perth and large tracts of what is now Perth suburbia covered in bushland. Does anyone remember horse and sulkies, I think they were called, in the milk? Some do, yes, I'm getting a few nods. And talking to my mum the other day, she recalled her grandma telling stories about smallpox. As you may know, smallpox was a devastating virus feared for centuries, causing death and disfigurement. And it was declared eradicated after a massive um, vaccination campaign, declared eradicated back in 1980. So there's been a, been a bit of a mood of reminiscing going on, and that was inspired by Simeon and Anna in the gospel reading today, along with Rembrandt's painting of their encounter with the baby Jesus, which is on the cover of the Order of Service. So today we're going to take more of a reflective, devotional approach. So what do we hear God saying to us through reflection on the event we recall today? So let's start with some details in the text. Anna was really quite old by the standards of her day. And whilst we don't exactly know how old Simeon was, the text gives clues that he was of a similar vintage to Anna, and towards the end of his years of life, and hanging on for a fulfilment which the Holy Spirit had promised to him. It made me wonder what had Simeon and Anna seen in their time, back in their day? So that, and I thought, they may remember, back in their day, seeing, for example, General Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, or Pompey the Great, conquering Jerusalem back in 63 BC, and the desecration of the temple when Pompey entered the holiest of holies. They would have seen the last remnants of the Jewish Hasmonean dynasty killed by Herod the Great as he consolidated his power in service to the Romans. They would have seen massive building works and apparent prosperity which Herod oversaw and wondered about the soul of the nation, even in the midst of that relative security. So much change. So much change. And for Simeon, in particular, who had that revelation that he would see the Lord's Messiah in his lifetime. We don't know when he got that revelation. We don't know. But let's say... He got it as a very young man, a teenager, as some people do experience great conviction about the call of God on their life at a very young age. So just imagine him going through those major changes just mentioned. Did his heart start pumping with nervous anticipation and excitement at those critical junctures as he wondered is now the time, is now the time. <clears throat> so I really love Rembrandt's depiction of Simeon, and you can have a look at it now if you like. He's mostly blind, he's well aged, he's got his mouth slightly open in wonder as he processes, could it be, 
could have been. His hands are together in prayer, maybe to stop them shaking as the realisation sets in of that moment. And there's light coming from both the Christ child and from above and beyond him, maybe a clue to the revelation which the Father was revealing at that time. A long wait, finally over for this most faithful servant. <clears throat> Amy, would you mind bringing me a glass of water? Thank you. And then we've got Anna, who looks quite different. <clears throat> so her eyes are transfixed on the child with a, <clears throat> a weightiness about her gaze. Maybe feeling with real depth the magnitude of the occasion and the words which Simeon offered. And if the painting looks not quite done, it's because it's not. It's actually the last painting of Rembrandt's life and he died before it was completely finished. But still, it says all it needs to say. And it represents an aspect of this sacred moment of fulfilment wonderfully. Now, on that note of representation, Simeon and Anna, as <clears throat> remarkable as they are in themselves, each represent something significant. They point to more than just their own stories. So for Anna, being of the tribe of Asher, that's one of the so-called lost tribes. <coughs> she could represent the lost northern kingdom. And with Simeon engaging in what looks like a priestly blessing, thus linking him to the southern kingdom, the two of them may signify a reunified people before the Messiah. Particularly given the emphasis of Anna being a constant presence in the temple, as that would be a, uh, a bit of a corrective, I guess, to the northern tribes having their own sacred sites, which were not quite kosher, shall we say. By the way, if I cough, I did have two rapid antigen tests in the week that were negative, so um, I'm not too pestilential. Now those things, I think, are reasonable to read into the text, but there is, there is more to glean, of course, and this is where we can hear some whispers to us from God. So Simeon is linked to something bigger than just the temple and just Jerusalem. He speaks of Israel at large and mentions Gentiles prior to Israel in respect to the salvation brought by the Messiah. Now, I haven't read this anywhere, so what I say next could be completely off the mark. But in this description of Simeon as a righteous and devout man, I heard an echo of how Job was described. Job, also a very righteous and devout man. But he was a pre-Israelite character. So there's, it's something like a literary pointer to righteousness and devotional integrity, um, but to an ancient and venerable man, technically outside the chosen people of God, the Hebrew people. Now I said we could hear whispers of God at this point, and you may be wondering if God could speak up a bit louder, given that the Gentile-Israelite distinction is very far from a hot-button issue anymore. We probably just don't even give it a second thought, if a first thought. But whilst Gentiles, as a collective group of outsiders because of ethnicity or nationhood, no longer make sense, there are always, always people who think they do not belong to God for whatever reason. There are always people who think they don't belong to God. 
there are always people who have not heard of Jesus Christ. There are always people who have an immature faith that was not properly nurtured. God knows there are always sinners who, through act of will, tragedy of circumstance, or anything in between, have blockages in the way of receiving God's grace. There are always people who think the church building will fall on their heads if they walk in the door. There are always people who will laugh at us, abuse us and revile us. There are always people who will hear the great command to love God, love their neighbour as they love themselves, and find one or more of those things very, very difficult to do. Some are filled with self-loathing. Some loathe the other. Some are variously frozen by or enraged by even the mention of God. So in one sense, Gentiles may be a thing of the past. In another, Gentiles are everywhere. So what do we do? Well, we share the good news, for one. We share the good news. <clears throat> At any stage in life, the faith of Christ can bring fulfilment and change. Think of old, old Simeon and Anna. Long, long years. Suddenly all made sense of right at the end. We share the good news. Other words, in other words, we call it evangelism. <clears throat> and evangelism is a call of all God's people in a sense. But some are particularly called to that vocation. And part of my prayer is that it may be God's will that new evangelists may be raised up within our church and our nation. And especially, if I'm being selfish, within the name we share for the Lord we serve, that of the Anglican Communion. But whether or not you are primarily called as an evangelist, there are things we can all do. We, there are things we can all do when the opportunity arises. For example, remind someone who really needs to hear it that God does love them. Remind someone who really needs to hear it that God does love them. We can invite the wayward, and those whose life is off the rails, to consider what God might want for their life, and actually how repentance and turning to Christ may just be the most life-giving thing they could do. You can invite someone to come along here, to taste and see that the Lord is good, and pray that the Holy Spirit may move within them. Those are things we could all do, should the opportunity arise. So lastly, I just want to mention um, the song of Simeon, which is that uh, part of the gospel which starts with, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. It's still frequently called by its Latin name, the nunc dimittis, meaning now you dismiss. And those hallowed words have formed part of the nighttime prayer life of Christians for centuries probably millennia and in most anglican prayer books probably all actually the service for prayer at the end of the day also called compline includes the nunc dimittis such is the enduring power the spirit-filled power of simeon's words and i want to commend that to you for your own prayers as you offer each day to God. Use Simeon's words 
to close out the day. But I wanted to finish now with another prayer from Compo um, that just seemed to really fit the bill for this morning. So I'm going to pray that now. Let us pray. Come, O Spirit of God, and make within us your dwelling place and home. May our darkness be dispelled by your light, and our troubles calmed by your peace. May all evil be redeemed by your love, all pain transformed through the suffering of Christ, and all dying glorified by his risen life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen.